You're watching The Legal Breakdown. So Glenn, we know from our last discussion that Trump appointed judge, Judge Cannon, uh, was the one responsible for appointing a special master uh, to review the Mar-a-Lago documents. Her decision was then overturned by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Trump declined to appeal that ruling by the 11th Circuit. So uh, effectively, the special master case is dead now. If Trump's goal was to delay, then why not just appeal it and further delay? You know, it, it feels like the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals decision, which was three zip. It was unanimous and it happened to be handed down by three judges who were appointed by Republican presidents. Two of those judges were appointed by Donald Trump himself. And it was such a scathing rebuke of what another Trump appointed judge, Judge Aileen Cannon, did. They actually called it interfering in DOJ's criminal investigation. It was such a rebuke that it, there doesn't seem to, there didn't seem to be any reason to appeal it or to seek review in the Supreme Court. Now, when has that ever stopped Donald Trump before? It really never has. So like you, I was a little bit surprised. I thought Trump would try to buy himself another week or two of delay, but this may be why he declined to do it. It looked like the court was unwilling to stay its opinion. In other words, say, listen, we've ruled against you, but we're going to kind of freeze everything in place and let you seek review in the Supreme Court. So it feels like it might have been a futile exercise for Donald Trump to appeal it because the special mas master would sort of remain off the table and all of the evidence that the Department of Justice has that it seized from Mar-a-Lago can be used by uh, special counsel Jack Smith. So an appeal really might not have bought Donald Trump any more delay anyway. Would he have started to get into the territory of like a frivolous lawsuit had he continued to further appeal it, given how scathing that that rebuke was from the 11th Circuit? It would have been frivolous. But you know what? The law says you can file a lawsuit as long as you have some good faith basis or claim to make. And, you know, there is this thing called a vexatious litigant where when somebody files frivolous lawsuit after frivolous lawsuit after frivolous lawsuit, sometimes the courts will step in and prohibit people from ever filing a lawsuit again on a particular issue. I will tell you, in all of my years of practice, rarely does that happen. OK, so there are no sanctions in this case then, given given that, you know, this thing is just kind of dead and, and we're moving on. But do you have an update on Judge Cannon's culpability here in terms of judicial misconduct or sanctions on on that end? So the only update I have is I have seen reports that lots of folks have filed judicial complaint forms. Anybody can file them. A member of the public can file them, and they're fairly easy to file. You just go to uscourts.gov, and it's about a one-and-a-half-page form. It's easy to fill out. It's pretty intuitive. I have heard that lots of those have been filed. Um, whether that will result in any sort of a legitimate investigation of the way Judge Cannon conducted herself in this Trump litigation is, is sort of anybody's guess. Okay. Now, separately, a federal judge, Judge Howell, uh, refused to hold Trump's office in contempt for not fully complying uh, with the subpoena to return all classified documents in the Mar-a-Lago case. If I remember correctly, his office signed an assurance, this is Trump's office, signed an assurance that he, that, that they did do this on his behalf, on Trump's behalf. So why was this the right decision then? If they signed that document uh, attesting to the fact that all of these documents were returned, then, then you know, why not be held in contempt for not fully complying with what they said they did? You know, it's a great question. And it feels like a real head scratcher because people want to know, did Judge Howell do the right thing by refusing to hold anybody in contempt? Did she do the wrong thing? And the, the answer is not easy or intuitive. And I think the best way to kind of get into Judge Beryl Howell's courtroom yesterday when she had this issue before her and had to make this decision is to go back to the beginning. Now, let me say, these hearings are behind closed doors because they involve grand jury matters. So we don't know precisely what went on in the courtroom, but there was some really good prompt reporting by uh, Hugo Lowell of The Guardian saying, OK, Judge Howell refused to hold anybody in contempt. And so that is kind of what we're working with by way of information about what happened. But let's go back to the beginning. So, 
you know, I, I think it's easier if we use a more commonplace example of a theft of property because, you know, a president stealing classified documents and national defense information is kind of not the, the everyday occurrence yeah. that is, is easy to understand. So here's what I want to do. Rather than talk about stolen documents, let's talk about a bank robbery because we can all envision a bank robbery, right? The robber coming out with big cartoon bags of stolen money, taking them to his house and concealing them. The law makes no distinction, Brian, between kinds of stolen property. So whether it's money or documents or a TV or a car, the law treats it all the same. And criminal investigations usually follow a normal course and pattern. This one didn't, and that's why DOJ finds itself in this investigative quagmire. Let's go back to our bank robbery. Let's assume somebody robs a bank, takes some of the money home, hides some of it, maybe spreads some of it out in a garage and in a storage facility, maybe spends some of it. What does law enforcement do? They investigate if they get enough evidence to apply for a search warrant to try to recover the stolen money. They get a search warrant. They conduct a search of the robber's property and they collect up all of the stolen money as best they can. But let's assume they didn't find it all. What do they do? Well, they arrest the perpetrator. They arrest the bank robber. They don't leave him out and about. And then they continue to investigate. How? Well, first of all, when they arrest the bank robber, they Mirandize him, read him his Miranda rights. And if he waves and agrees to be interviewed, they say, hey, bud, where did you hide the rest of the money? They also conduct an investigation of eyewitnesses and the bank robbers, friends and families and criminal associates to try to figure out where the rest of the money is. And then what we in law enforcement do is we get supplemental arrest warrants. That's how an investigation is conducted. Now, let's shift. You know what they don't do, Brian, before I go to the president? What they don't do is give the bank robber a grand jury subpoena. Say, Mr. Bank Robber, would you mind returning all the money you stole? You know, just bring it to the grand jury pursuant to this subpoena. Oh, and if you don't, we're going to ask a judge to appoint a records custodian over the money you stole. And if you won't do that, we're going to ask the judge to hold you in contempt for not appointing a records custodian over the money you stole. Now, can you see how none of that makes investigative sense? Let's shift over to Donald Trump. Instead of doing what they should have done, they being DOJ, and instead of doing what DOJ would have done if it was you or me stealing classified documents or anybody other than Donald Trump, they would have uh, gotten that search warrant, searched Trump's property and, and recovered all of the classified documents they could find, arrest the perpetrator, Donald Trump, and then continue the investigation to see if they could get more search warrants and recover more of the documents. They didn't do that. Why? because they treated Donald Trump differently than every other person who might steal classified documents. They put him a little above the law. And that is why they find themselves in this mess. So what happened after they issued the subpoena, Donald Trump disobeyed the subpoena, committing the crime of obstruction of justice for which Donald Trump has not been locked up or indicted or held accountable. And they continue to struggle with this sort of completely unconventional investigative path. DOJ has kind of dug themselves into a hole. So what do they do? They run into Judge Beryl Howell's uh, chambers. And as I say, this is a sealed matter because Chief Judge Beryl Howell in federal district court in DC has supervisory authority over the grand jury. So they went to Judge Howell and they said, Judge Howell, uh, Trump and company are not complying with this subpoena. They're not giving us over all the documents. So what we're asking you to do, Judge, is force them to appoint a records custodian. And if they don't do it and they don't certify again, they've already certified it once and it turned out to be a lie. If they don't certify again that they've turned everything over, we want you to hold them in contempt. This doesn't make any investigative sense, Brian, because Judge Howell is not going to say, oh, OK, let me force them to name a records custodian who will then say, I have control over all of the documents Donald Trump stole. These are not business records. This is evidence of crime. And so Chief Judge Howell quite appropriately said, I'm not going to do it. 
I'm not going to force them to name a records custodian over the stuff Donald Trump stole that he continues to unlawfully conceal. That's not the way it works. Um, but this is where DOJ finds itself. So when people hear the reporting that, oh my goodness, Judge Howell refused to hold them in contempt, refused to do what DOJ wants Judge Howell to do, it's because she doesn't really have the authority to do it. And unlike Judge Cannon, Judge Howell cares about the law yeah. and about the procedure, and she's doing it right. So, you know, this is where we are. It's it's not easy to understand. It's not intuitive. But I think Judge Howell made the right decision. So is it basically that that the fact that um, the appointment of of a records custodian, for example, was was an ill gotten move that supersedes the fact that the Trump team, you know, basically lied in their attestation that uh, that all the documents were handed over. That was kind of a gratuitous lie. It is a lie that can form the basis of an obstruction of justice charge or potentially other criminal charges. But the way you go about dealing with this is not to try to pull a judge into this dispute and have them mediate. The way you handle this is you indict the perpetrators and you continue to investigate. And Judge Howell, J Judge Howell's no speaks volumes because federal judges have been saying for many months now in substance, DOJ, do your job. Hold Donald Trump accountable for yeah. his crimes. Judge Reggie Walton has said that in some of his written findings and conclusions in insurrection cases, for example. Judge Emmett Sullivan has said it. Judge Amit Mehta has said it. Judge Amy Berman Jackson has said it. Most pointedly and directly, Judge David Carter, a federal judge, said Donald Trump, together with John Eastman, committed two federal felonies. He obstructed official proceedings, the certification of Joe Biden's win, and he was in a conspiracy to commit crimes against or defraud the United States. The federal judiciary continues to scream in uncharacteristic fashion that DOJ needs to move out and hold Trump accountable for his crimes. You heard more of that yesterday in Judge Beryl Howell's loud, no, I'm not intervening, DOJ, do your job. Right, as opposed to like getting mired in some process dispute between, uh, between you know the 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 Trump lawyers or the Trump team and uh, and uh, you know a, a judge themselves. So, um, with that said, we'll leave it there. Obviously, a lot to continue watching, and uh, you know from from all of their lips to God's ears in terms of uh, getting this thing moving and holding Trump accountable. Uh, with that said, for anybody watching, if you want to continue to get updates on any breaking legal news. Uh, follow both my channel and Glenn's channel. The links are right here on the screen. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. And I'm Glenn Kirshner. And you're watching The Legal Breakdown. <laughs>